This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. This is episode 98, entitled, Mark's Son of Man Who Forgives Sins. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. Hopefully our podcast episodes have helped you to have those important conversations. My name is Dustin Smith. As always, I will be your host. We have been exploring, as of late, what the phrase Son of Man means within the Hebrew Bible. Its appearances, both in Hebrew and Aramaic, depict a human being, a mortal, who is distinct from God. Daniel's son of man indicated a special human agent who was to receive dominion, glory, and kingship. We now have enough background to turn to the New Testament and observe its depictions of Jesus as the Son of Man, which happens to be his favorite self-reference. In fact, in the Synoptic Gospels, you will only find the phrase Son of Man on the mouth of Jesus. For the next few episodes of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, we will explore the Gospel of Mark, our earliest New Testament Gospel account, to see how it portrays Jesus as the Son of Man. Our aim is to better understand this title in regard to its Christological significance. Does Mark depict the Son of Man as the second member of the Trinity, as God in the flesh, or perhaps even as a pre-existing heavenly angel? Or is the Son of Man a genuine human being, both distinct from and authorized by the true God. Let's find out on this week's episode of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Our first point today will be looking at the authority of the Son of Man to forgive sins. I'm going to read a passage here out of Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together, so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak this way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out of the sight of everyone. So that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. That's Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This is the first conflict story in Mark's gospel. It deals specifically with the Son of Man and the authority he possesses. It is also interesting to note that the final conflict story in Mark is also a Son of Man incident involving his authority. In other words, Mark has bookended his gospel with the question regarding Jesus as the Son of Man 
and the authority he possesses. This particular passage in Mark chapter 2 is no insignificant story from Mark's perspective as a narrator. In this account, Jesus heals the paralytic and tells him that his sins are forgiven. Some of the scribes question whether Jesus is authorized to forgive sins, wondering if anyone other than God alone could forgive sins. It is crucially important that we understand correctly the nature of the conflict here. Some of the scribes accuse Jesus of blaspheming because of the assumption that only God can forgive sins. The question regards whether Jesus is usurping the divine prerogative to forgive sins, and if he is, then Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. The scribes do not conclude that Jesus is God. There is no mention of this conclusion at all in the passage. Nor is there any expectation on the part of the scribes that the coming Jewish Messiah would be God in the flesh. That option isn't even on the mental radar of the scribes. The issue, plainly, is whether Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Mark records Jesus responding to the internal deliberation of the scribes by saying that the Son of Man indeed has authority on the earth to forgive sins. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, using the term as a title with the definite article in Greek. Jesus' response is that the Son of Man, that is, the human being, has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus does not claim to be God or the second person of the Trinity. His argument is that he is able to forgive sins in the manner that is not blasphemous because he has the authority to do so. Furthermore, he possesses this authority as a human being. This is what I like to call high human Christology. As a human being, the Son of Man, Jesus bears the divine prerogative to forgive sins. Adela Collins, in her commentary on Mark in the Hermeneus series, says, quote, Jesus has the power to forgive sins because he is the chief agent of God. End quote. That's on page 189 in her commentary on Mark's gospel. I think that's right. I think Jesus here is functioning as the chief agent of God who has received the authority to forgive sins from the true God. What is important to note from Mark's perspective as a narrator is that Jesus is not the only person authorized by God to forgive sins. And this leads us to our next point. Our second point today is looking at the forgiveness of sins within Mark's gospel. I'm going to read a passage here out of Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. That's Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 5. Mark literally begins his gospel by identifying John the Baptist as a human being who is involved in the mediation of the forgiveness of sins to others. In fact, the authority John possesses is described with scriptural quotations from Isaiah and Malachi. Mark 
actually identifies John the Baptist as an authorized human being who can confer upon others the forgiveness of sins. In fact, John drew large crowds from both Jerusalem and the region of Judea. No one seemed to conclude that John the Baptist was God in the flesh if he was able to baptize for the forgiveness of sins. In other words, Mark has already prepared his readers that God is in the business of endorsing certain human beings with the divine prerogative to forgive sins. The ability to forgive sins does not prove that someone is God himself. A plain reading of John the Baptist's successful ministry demonstrates why readers of John's Gospel should not agree with the conclusions drawn by the scribes in the incident involving the paralytic in Mark chapter 2, our initial passage. Let's look at another passage involving the forgiveness of sins here in Mark chapter 11. Jesus says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. That's in Mark chapter 11 and verse 25. As we can see, later in Mark's gospel, Jesus authorizes the disciples to also forgive sins. This is further confirmation that the authority to forgive sins can be shared with authorized human beings, as we have seen with now both John the Baptist and with the Son of Man. Let's look at our third point today, which is the Son of Man's authority on the earth. I want to recall the passage that is the crux of our paralytic story, our conflict story from Mark chapter 2, looking at verses 10 through 11, where Jesus says, But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. Mark 2, verses 10 through 11. It is crucial that we take stock at what this phrase is actually saying. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Earth, of course, is the counterpart of heaven. Claiming to possess authority on earth maintains a distinction from the God above. However, the gospel message that Jesus preached was the announcement that the reign of God has drawn near. You can see that in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. Jesus preached that the kingdom of God, the reign of God, has drawn near. It would seem that Jesus bearing the authority of God to forgive sins on earth is at least one way in which the reign of God is drawing near to earth. It's not the only way that the kingdom or the reign of God is drawing near, but it is certainly one way in which God's reign, the reign of heaven, is drawing near to earth because Jesus possesses authority on earth as the authoritative Son of Man. Of course, as soon as we notice that the Son of Man has related themes with the reign of God and the earth, this immediately points us back to the Son of Man figure from Daniel chapter 7. I want to recall what Daniel 7 says about the Son of Man in Daniel 7 verse 14, where it says, To him, to the Son of Man, was given dominion, glory, and kingship. That's in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 14. The Son of Man was given dominion, glory, and kingship. As we can observe, the Son of Man, described in Daniel chapter 7, was to receive these three things, dominion, glory, and kingship. That Aramaic word for kingship could also be translated as a kingdom. To be given dominion and kingship is to be given authority within those realms. 
that is the realm that is upon the earth. Just as Mark records Jesus saying. Daniel chapter 7 goes on, as we noted in our last episode, to unpack what this vision means by saying that the sovereignty and dominion, which is given to the Son of Man, is located, quote, under the whole heavens, end quote. That is what is said in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27. The sovereignty and the dominion given to the Son of Man is under the whole heavens. Clearly, that is upon the earth. Furthermore, the fact that God shares his own glory with the Son of Man already demonstrates that God is willing to share his divine prerogatives with this special human agent. So when Jesus claims to be the Son of Man in possession of authority from God to forgive sins, this is the sort of relationship between God and the Son of Man that Daniel chapter 7 has led us to expect. Mark clearly records Jesus speaking as the Son of Man in a manner that draws upon the vision in Daniel chapter 7. Another theme that can be discerned from seeing a human being receive privileges from God that are used upon the earth, specifically authority from God, draws us back to the images of Adam in Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read a passage here in Genesis 1, starting in verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That's Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 28. The primordial human being, Adam, and we must remember that Adam is the Hebrew word for human, was given authority on the earth as a natural function of one bearing kingship and dominion. Adam is another example of a human being sharing in the privileges of God, acting as a vice regent who shares in God's reign upon the earth. Certainly, Adam possessed authority from God upon the earth. And the fact remains that the Greek text of Genesis 1, 26-30 uses the phrase upon the earth in Greek, which is the phrase epitesis, three times. And this is the very same phrase that we see in Mark chapter 2 and verse 10 where Jesus states that the Son of Man has authority upon the earth, epitesis in Greek. Perhaps Mark is portraying Jesus, the authorized Son of Man, as the second Adam, a theme some thought was only present in the theology of Paul. Some modern scholars have observed that second Adam, Christology, is actually present in the Gospel of Mark. So, in conclusion, we have observed that the Son of Man is a deeply important Christological self-reference used by Jesus. The Gospel of Mark, our earliest Gospel account, depicts Jesus describing himself as the Son of Man, for the first of many times, in a conflict story involving the healing of the paralytic. We first observe that Jesus, functioning as the human Son of Man, possesses authority from God to forgive sins. This means that God has shared his unique prerogatives, typically reserved for God alone, with his human agent, Jesus Christ. When the scribes consider whether Jesus was guilty of blasphemy, of blasphemy for announcing the forgiveness of sins, the reader is not left with the conclusion that the Son of Man is God in the flesh or the second member of the Trinity. Instead, we learn that Jesus possesses authority on earth 
to do acts that are typically reserved for God alone, and that Jesus is able to forgive sins as a human being, as the Son of Man. Second, we noted that Mark has already prepared his readers for the revelation that God can invest his prerogative of forgiving sins into special human agents like the Son of Man by introducing his gospel account with John the Baptist, baptizing residents of Jerusalem and Judea for the forgiveness of sins. John was also a special human being through whom the forgiveness of sins was mediated to the people. No one concluded that John the Baptist was blaspheming or that John had to be God incarnate in order to pronounce that those who submitted to water baptism were forgiven of their transgressions. Furthermore, Jesus later in the Gospel of Mark allows his disciples to forgive sins, indicating that even other human beings could act as agents of God bearing prerogatives typically reserved for God alone. Lastly, we saw that the authority Jesus possesses as the Son of Man is an authority on the earth. This highlights the image of the one like a Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, a human figure who was to receive from God dominion, glory, and kingship in a realm described as, quote, under the whole heavens, end quote. Furthermore, the Son of Man possessing authority on the earth recalls the primordial human ruler, Adam, who shared in God's sovereign kingship upon the earth. Thus, when Jesus claims to be the human Son of Man in possession of authority on the earth, he is functioning as Daniel's Son of Man and, as I would argue, the second Adam. All of these points indicate that Mark's depiction of Jesus as the authorized Son of Man is most compatible with a high human Christology, and it is incompatible with a divine or Trinitarian Christology. If you would like to support the Biblical Unitarian Podcast, please check out this episode's description for a PayPal link. If this is your first time to the podcast, I would like to personally welcome you and thank you for listening to the show. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of the future episodes and so you can go back and check out our depository of previous episodes on a variety of Christological subjects. If you are a regular listener to the podcast, thank you so much for supporting the show. My name is Dustin Smith. Thank you so much for listening to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Until next time, you folks, take care.